You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring the scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome. I'm glad you're here with me on a fine Tuesday afternoon. I hope you're feeling blessed. I hope that the Lord's presence is with you, and I hope that you are feeling strong in your faith right now. You're watching Three Crowns. This is a show about Trinitarian apologetics. This is a show where we glorify the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This show is brought to you by Faith Unaltered YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already. If you haven't done so already, what are you waiting for? Today's a great day to do it. Go ahead and uh, hit that subscribe button. I'm not even going to tell you to smash it. That always comes across as a little bit aggressive. You can just click it like a normal person. Uh, if you want to smash it, uh, the the like button and the subscribe button, you know, you do you. But you can also just click it. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your love. And we've got a lot of cool stuff going on at Faith Unaltered, a lot of great content. Today's episode of Three Crowns. I am going to be focusing on what the early church taught about the divinity of Jesus Christ and about the Trinity. We'll be focusing even more specifically on the divinity of Jesus Christ, his full godhood, his full deity. And I will do my best to persuade you and to demonstrate to you that the early church quite clearly articulated a belief in the full divinity and Godhood of Jesus Christ, and a belief in the Holy Trinity. See, the early church, just like this show, Three Crowns, understood that the Father is King, so they crown Him. The Son is King, so they crown Him. And the Holy Spirit is King, so they crown Him. That's one, two, three crowns. Dane Von Ace didn't make that up. That's from the Bible. That's from the early church. So many of you all know that last week, I had a discussion with Dr. Dale Tuggy, who is a famous Unitarian, and I really enjoyed talking with Dr. Tuggy. It was collegial. It was friendly. I thought it was fruitful. Uh, there was no barking or grandstanding or, you know, just hollering at each other. We really, I think both were very thoughtful and calm and, and uh, gentle and, and talking about all these different topics regarding the divinity of Christ and the Holy Trinity. So, I appreciated Dr. Tuggy taking time out of his schedule to talk with us. And this week, Tyler and I had planned to fully review my discussion with Dr. Tuggy. That was what we were planning to do. And then something kind of too bad happened. This morning, I got a text from Tyler. He is sick. He can't do the show. And I really wanted him to be on that show where we discussed my conversation with Dr. Tuggy. And so I thought, I'm going to focus in on just one particular thing that came up in that conversation, and then we're going to do a bigger review of it later. I wanted to focus on one particular thing he said where he made a claim which is verifiably false, and I'm not saying that to be rude. He's just wrong. He claimed that nobody in the early church taught the Trinity. Nobody in the early church believed in the full deity of Christ, and that is just an absolute false statement. There's no way I can beat around the bush with that. It's not true. And Dr. Tuggy should be familiar with the early church writings. He has a, a PhD. I believe he actually has three PhDs. And he's written books on this stuff. He should know better. I will always give the charitable you know, side of things and, and just say, well, maybe he just isn't reading it thoroughly or isn't uh, comprehending what the original authors intended. But I'm going to show you today that beyond all doubt, the early church taught the full divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, one real quick caveat, the early church is not infallible the same way that the scripture is infallible. However, the testimony and witness of the early church is extremely weighty because some of these men, like uh, we're going to we're going to talk about Ignatius and and, you know, Polycarp. Some of these guys were direct students of the apostles, like uh, the lineage goes Apostle John, Polycarp, Ignatius. So even if the testimony of the early church isn't infallible and they can be wrong on certain things, their witness is still weighty, it's significant, and it shouldn't be overlooked or dismissed as 
as just, uh, you know, whatever, who cares? We should care deeply about what the early church fathers taught, and especially on this most important topic of the Trinity and that of the deity of Jesus Christ. There is a really strange, unfortunate conspiracy theory, and it is a conspiracy theory. And by the way, by the way, uh, I'm all right with a conspiracy theory here and there. I've got some things that I think are a little wonky, and, and you know, I think that the conspiracy theorists have uh, have something to say. But you you have to look at a conspiracy theory theory based on its data. Like, what is the other side that's saying there's a conspiracy bringing to the table as evidence? And there's this unfortunate conspiracy theory running around the Internet that basically the Trinity and the deity of Christ was invented by the Council of Nicaea and Emperor Constantine and yada, yada, yada. And it's just fallacious. It is silly. And it's really, um, you know, just it's one of those things that happened on the Internet and and people ran with it. And it's not accurate. I will show that today beyond all reasonable doubt. Now, my uh, friend Jordan Thornburg, who I know he's a Unitarian and he and I go back and forth a lot um, in private messages and things and and Jordan, I have love for you, even though we we disagree on on uh, the deity of Christ and all these really important issues. He commented here something that I want to show you all. He said he loves this topic. Thanks. Uh, that's awesome. I'm glad that you're um, interested in what we're talking about today. And he said, just make sure we don't assume being called God means they thought he was the supreme God. They used that word more liberally with, than we do today. So what he's saying is if we go through the early church fathers and they say our God and Lord Jesus Christ, we can't just run with that and say that that's a teaching on the deity of Christ. And that's true. We're going to go far further than that. We're going to show that they believe Jesus is Yahweh, that they believe Jesus is eternal, that they believe Jesus created the universe, that they believe Jesus is fully God, and that they believe Jesus has the same substance as the Father, that they, that Jesus shares the same essence as the Father. So we will go far further than that, Jordan. One other note, though, Jordan, that I want to point out. It is pretty compelling evidence that they believe in the deity of Christ when they call him God over and over and over and over again, right? I know that Moses is, is said to be like a God unto Pharaoh, Exodus 7, 1. But you don't see throughout the whole canon of Scripture and throughout the entirety of the early church fathers them writing about Moses as God over and over and over and over again. So I will say that even though it's not just clear definitive proof when they say, you know, our God and Savior Jesus Christ or our Lord and God Jesus Christ, it's not definitive proof that they right there that they saw him as fully divine. When you start seeing that they call him that over and over and over and over again, it is still pretty significant. And no other, uh, you know, no other prophet is is spoken about like that. But no, we will go further than that, Jordan. I promise you. I promise you, if you listen closely, you're going to be convinced today, Jordan. Today is the day uh, you will be convinced at least of this, at least that the early church fathers believed in the full divinity of Jesus Christ. And every father I'm going to quote today is pre-Nicaea 1. Every single father that I quote today, what I'm pulling from will be before the year 325. So you can't say that, oh, they were just influenced by Constantine and Nicaea and that boogeyman out there that was spreading Trinitarianism. No, you're going to see that this is all pre-Nicaea. This is early, early, early church that we're going to be talking about today. So first, let me show you where Dr. Tuggy says something that uh, is just wrong. Okay, so this is this is the discussion I had with Dr. Tuggy. This was on Monday of last week, and he says something that's just wrong. I want to play the clip, and then I'm going to spend the whole rest of the show demonstrating that he's wrong. Okay, here's what Dr. Tuggy says. He's been asked a question, and the question is, why were the Trinitarians who preserved and canonized the text you know, too stupid to interpret the text properly for 2,000 years? That was a, a question that came in from GU from the audience. Here is how Dr. Tuggy responded to that.
Hey, are y'all not hearing this? Uh, Numeric said no sound on the playback video. Is that true? Y'all can't hear it? Could anybody hear it? Um, nobody could hear it. All right, well, then I'll just remove that. So here's what he says. Y'all can go find the video. It's in our Faith Unaltered library. So y'all can go find the video. Um, he, he says nobody in the early church believed Jesus was God and that nobody in the early church believed in the Trinity. Okay, so that's what he says. And you can go hear it um, in his own words. Uh, yes, uh, timestamp. Thank you. I'll put it in here. Timestamp is, let's see. Give me one second. The timestamp is one hour, 30 minutes and 38 seconds. And, you know, he talks for a few few minutes. So timestamp on it is one hour, 30 minutes, 38 seconds. That's really weird. Um, I wonder why it's. Hang with me for two seconds, y'all. I'm going to try something and see what happens. Let's just see what happens. Y'all hear anything? Still nothing? That's so weird. I wonder what that's about. All right. Well, then here's what's going to happen. Y'all can watch that in your own time. He basically makes the claim that the the doctrine of the Trinity, the, the early church didn't teach it whatsoever. It's just not there before Nicaea. And here we go. Let's jump into proving that completely wrong. So let's start with Tertullian, right? Tertullian's a good place to start. Tertullian is, he is speaking against heresies in his work against Praxius. And he is specifically addressing what will, you know, become known as modalism and what will become known as, uh, you know, oneness the idea that that there's just one person in the Godhead who is sometimes acting as father, sometimes as son, sometimes as Holy Spirit, but it's all just one person. So this is not exactly what Dr. Tuggy holds to Unitarianism that he holds to, but it's like a weird flavor of Unitarianism. But in the response to Praxius that Tertullian is giving, he uses the word Trinity. By the way, this is not the first time the word Trinity has ever been used. The very first time is in the year 180 by Theophilus of Antioch. I've shared that quote with you all before where he says um, that uh, the Father, the Word, and His wisdom are a Trinity. And uh, speaking of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, of course. So I'm going to have another quote from Theophilus of Antioch here on this show later. But you all have seen that one before. This this quote from Tertullian is, you know, in the years of uh, the 200s, so well before Nicaea, and you're going to see him use the, the phrase Trinity. It's a long, lengthy quote, but again, I'm going to give you all a bunch of meat to chew on. I'm going to give you all lengthy quotes today because you need to see them in their fullness, and you'll see that Dr. Tuggy is misrepresenting the truth. So here we go. So, okay, one of the big concerns Tertullian had is that in the modalist thinking that the father just, you know, takes on the hat of the son, that this would imply the father suffered. And so he starts this by saying the father didn't suffer. Uh, so he's going to phrase it like they would, right? In the course of time, then the father forsooth was born and the father suffered God himself, the Lord Almighty, whom in their preaching, they declared, declared to be Jesus Christ. So he's confronting that heresy of modalism, saying, you all believe the father's the one who suffered because you believe it's just one person. The father just uh, you know, becomes the son. So now he's going to go to the orthodox side of things, and we'll see what he says. So starting here, this this is him confronting that heresy. He says, we, however, as we indeed always have done, and more especially since we have been better instructed by the paraclete who leads men indeed into all truth, believe that there is only one God, but under the following dispensation as it is called, that there is one only God, uh, that this one only God has also a son, his word, who proceeded from himself, by whom all things were made, 
and without whom nothing was made. So right there, Tertullian is saying the Son, the Word, is co-creator with the Father. Him we believe to have been sent by the Father into the Virgin. So there is, he's believing in the pre-existence of Christ. Jesus doesn't originate in Mary's womb. He is sent into her womb. And just so you know, that's right in line with what uh, with what the Bible teaches, what Jesus teaches in John 6. The bread of heaven has uh, come down from heaven to earth, right? John 6, verses 33 and 38, 62, how he has come down from heaven to earth. So him we believe to have been sent by the Father into the virgin and to have been born of her, being both man and God the Son of Man and the Son of God, and to have been called by the name of Jesus Christ. We believe him to have suffered, died, and been buried according to the Scriptures, and after he had been raised again by the Father and taken back to heaven to be sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that he will come to judge the quick and the dead, who sent also from heaven from the Father, according to his own promise, the Holy Ghost, the Paraclete, the Sanctifier of the faith of those who believe in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Ghost. So he's saying that the true faith is those who believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That this rule of faith, what rule of faith? The faith of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Trinitarian faith, has come down to us from the beginning of the gospel. So from the apostles, from the New Testament, even before any of the older heretics, much more before Praxius, a pretender of yesterday, will be apparent both from the lateness of date with marks of all heresies and also from the absolute, absolutely novel character of our newfangled praxis. In this principle, also we must henceforth find a presumption of equal force against all heresies whatsoever, that whatever is first is true, whereas that is spurious, which is later in date. But keeping this perspective rule inviolate, Still, some opportunity must be given for reviewing the statements of heretics with a view to the instruction and protection of various persons, were it only that it may not seem that each perversion of the truth is condemned without examination and simply prejudged, especially in the case of this heresy, which supposes itself to possess the pure truth, and thinking that one cannot believe in one only God in any other way than by saying that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are the very selfsame person. So he's saying uh, these heretics think the only way God can be one is if the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one person. And now he's going to refute that and say they're three persons. As if this way also were not all, in that all are one by unity, that is of substance, while the mystery of the dispensation is still guarded, which distributes the unity into what? Trinity! Placing in the order the what? Three persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Three, however, not in condition, but in degree, not in substance, but in form, not in power, but in aspect, yet one substance and of one condition and of one power, inasmuch as he is one God, from whom these degrees and forms and aspects are reckoned under the name Father and Son and Holy Ghost. All right, I hope that you were paying attention. I know that was a lot. I know that's dense reading. That's Tertullian. So he says that there are three persons who are in unity trinity, in unity trinity. He uses that exact word. I'll blow it up for you there. Jordan, I I really want you to see this, bro, Um, right here. Look at that. I'm zooming in on it. Unity into a trinity. Unity into a trinity. And what does he say? He says that they are unified in substance, Uh, He says they're unified in substance, but they are differentiated in degree. So uh, these are, and and in persons. So Tertullian clearly uses the word Trinity. He clearly says that they uh, are of one substance right here. All are of one by unity, that is substance. So when anti-Trinitarians say that nobody ever taught that the son is of the same substance as the father before Nicaea. Tertullian disproves that. Jordan, uh, you've you've posted here, Tertullian says the one and only God is the father, didn't he? He may, but you have to keep that in context. 
the one God and then the begotten son and the spirit who proceeds from the one God who share the same substance and are all eternal. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. He may have had that monarchy of the father view that the East Eastern Orthodox still uphold, but monarchy of the father view doesn't deny the Trinity. It's just making a, a, a distinction between the fathers, you know, being purely uh, without source. The son has the source, which is the father, but he eternally so, eternally begotten. But this is very clear right here in Tertullian that he thinks all three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are of the same substance, and they are unified in that substance, but they are distinct in their personhood. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. That's what we've always been trying to explain, and it's right there in Tertullian's writings. And I'll I'll highlight again for you how Tertullian said that uh, this was the belief from the beginning of the gospel. So right here. So the sanctifier of the faith is the Holy Spirit, and he sanctifies those who believe in the Father and in and in the Son, and in the Holy Ghost, and that that is the rule of faith that was handed down to us from the beginning. So Tertullian is basically saying what Jude is talking about in Jude 1.3, the faith once for all handed down to the saints, that faith is a Trinitarian faith. That that has been uh, right there from the beginning. All right, so that's Tertullian using the word Trinity. And I want to show you something that Methodius wrote. Methodius wrote in uh, 260 to 312, and we have some of his writings still extant. Of course, Methodius is before Nicaea. All right, so I'm going to add Methodius to the screen. This is in Methodius's works called Orations on the Psalms, and now let me find let me find this here. All right. So look at what he says here. Let me make sure I've added it to the screen. Okay. Yeah. So this is Methodius orations on the Psalms. And he writes for the kingdom of the father of the son and of the Holy ghost is one, even as their substance is one and their dominion is one. <laughs> That's the Trinity. That's, before Nicaea, Methodius is saying their substance is one and their dominion is one, meaning they are co-equal, co-eternal, co-authoritative. That's the Trinity. The kingdom is whose kingdom? The Father's kingdom, the Son's kingdom, the Holy Spirit's kingdom. It's right there in Methodius. Look, at he goes on to make it even stronger. Whence also with one and the same adoration, we worship the one deity in three persons. I'm going to blow this up. We adore and worship the one deity in three persons. Jordan, this is pre-Nicaea, bro. Dr. Tuggy, this is pre-Nicaea. Clearly, the church believed in the Trinity before Nicaea. One deity, three persons. Methodius says it beautifully. It's right there in the early church. One substance and one dominion, yet three persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I couldn't have worded it better myself. Methodius, St. Methodius. He's an OG, an OG Trinitarian. You got to love it. You truly got to love it. Let's see. I believe Origen uses the word Trinity as well. Let me add Origen to the stage here, and uh, we'll see what he has to say. So Origen, now Origen's weird, right? Because I'm not going to sit here today and tell you that Origen is a great authority because he had some really wacky and, and even off base beliefs. But the fact that he is speaking in the 200s about the Trinity shows us that this was a commonly held belief all throughout the universal church. So this is another one of those really long quotes, hunker down with me and, and buckle up, but it's important that you hear the whole quote because I don't want you to think I'm taking anything out of context. So Origen writes this, it is now time after the rapid consideration, which to the best of our ability we have given to the topics discussed to recapitulate by way of summing up what we have said in different places, the individual points, and first of all, to restate our conclusions regarding the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Seeing God the Father is invisible and inseparable from the Son, 
The son is not generated from prolation, as some suppose, for if the son be a prolation of the father, the term prolation being used to signify such a generation as that of animals or men usually is, then of necessity, both he who prolated and he who was prolated are corporeal. So what's he saying here? The son isn't prolated or generated or begotten like animals or humans are, uh, because that would imply the father and the son have corporeal bodies. So let's see what he does end up saying. For we do not say, as the heretics suppose, that some part of the substance of God was converted into the son, or that the son was procreated by the father out of things non-existence, non-existent, i.e. beyond his own substance. Okay, pause. So what's he saying? However the Son is generated, however he is eternally begotten, it is from the substance of the Father. He is of the substance of the Father. There's that word substance again. Um, so that there was once a time when he did not exist, and he's saying that's not the case. But putting away all corporeal conceptions, we say that the word and wisdom was begotten out of the invisible and incorporeal without any corporeal feeling as if it were an act of the will proceeding from the understanding nor seeing he is called the son of his love will it appear absurd if in this way he be called the son of his will nay john also indicates that god is light and paul also declares that the sun is the splendor of everlasting light as light accordingly could never exist without splendor so neither can the Son be understood to exist without the Father, for he is called the express image of his person and the word and, and wisdom. How then can it be asserted that there was once a time when he was not the Son? For that is, for that is nothing else than to say that there was a time when he was not the truth, nor the wisdom, nor the life. Although in all these he is judged to be the perfect essence of God the Father. So look at that. He is saying Jesus is judged by the church to be the perfect essence of God the Father. Who is Jesus? He is the perfect essence of God the Father. For these things cannot be severed from him or even be separated from his essence. And although these qualities are said to be many in understanding, yet in their nature and essence they are one, and in them is the fullness of divinity. So these attributes of word and wisdom, the essence of word and wisdom, the essence of uh, light and life, the essence of truth, all of these contain the fullness of divinity, and these are the essence of Jesus, therefore Jesus is fully divine. Now this expression which we employ, that there was never a time when he did not exist, is to be understood with an allowance. For these very words, when or never, have a meaning that relates to time, whereas the statements made regarding Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are to be understood transcending all time all ages, and all eternity. Now look at this. For it is the Trinity alone which exceeds the comprehension not only of temporal, but even of eternal intelligence. Boom! Shaka laka 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 laka. What is Origen saying? He is saying that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all transcend time. They're all eternal and actually even transcend eternality, whatever that might mean. I mean, that's mind-boggling. But he, But no matter what, our conclusions around that mind-boggling statement are he is clearly proclaiming the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are of the same essence, and that essence is outside of time, outside of space, that, that they are um, God. They are all fully God. While other things which are not included in it are to be measured by times and ages. The Son of God, then, in respect of the Word being God, which was in the beginning with God, no one will logically suppose to be contained in any place. No one will logically suppose that the Son of God can be contained in any place. Now, isn't that exactly what the Unitarians are trying to say, that he actually is confined to one place? They'll say Jesus can't be omnipresent, but only through his spirit is that possible. But he's just a man. He, he, he doesn't uh, transcend place, according to the Unitarian. But for nine months, he actually was completely locked into Mary's womb. That was the only place he could possibly be at that moment. And Origen calls that out as logically impossible once you comprehend that Jesus is the life, the truth, and shares the essence of the Father. Unitarians, you are the ones that Origen is calling here illogical. That's you that he's talking to. 
So that's Origin talking about the Trinity. Um, now let's look at, uh, and, and again, he used the word Trinity there. Let's pull up um, some others. I think Hippolytus, I can't remember if, he doesn't mention the word tr- Trinity, but Hippolytus does speak about the Son being of the same substance as the Father. Let's do that next. So this is the website, Stand to Reason. It's Greg Kokel's website. And he has some early church father quotes here. And he has footnotes for all of them. See the number. So you can fact check this. In fact, I'll put this into the I'll put this into the chat if y'all want to look at it too. It's pretty, pretty awesome. The other website I've been on is New Advent, and you can get almost any of the early church fathers on New Advent. So Hippolytus, he is writing between 170 and 235 AD, again, before Nicaea. Everything I'm doing today is before Nicaea. And he says this, the Logos, aka the Word, alone, uh, the Logos alone of this God is from God himself, wherefore also the Logos is God, being the substance of God. So very clearly, Hippolytus of Rome, early church theologian, Uh, He believes that Jesus Christ shares the substance of the Father. So next time a Unitarian tells you that nobody was talking about Christ sharing the substance of the Father until Nicaea, you can just tell them that that's patently false. We have now seen Tertullian speak of this, Methodius, Origen, Hippolytus. It's, It's out there. It's all out there. So now here's where I want to go next. Now I want to show you all where the early church fathers clearly demonstrate a belief in the preexistence of Christ. Now, all the things I've quoted already, they also proclaim the preexistence of Christ, but I was kind of taking it from the angle of, of the doctrine of the Trinity, how they were using the word Trinity. Now I'll show you where they use uh, language that clearly shows Jesus as, as preexistent you know, that he was doing works in the Old Testament, that he was doing things with the Father even before he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary. So we'll look at that sort of stuff now. One of the really cool ones is Justin Martyr. If you're not familiar with Justin Martyr and his uh, dialogue with Trifo, I strongly recommend you you get familiar with it. Check this out. Justin Martyr writes this, and he's writing, as you can see here, between 100 and 165 He's a Christian apologist. He's um, answering questions from this guy named Trifo in his dialogue with Trifo and giving the Christian view on things. And look what he says here. And that Christ being Lord and God, the Son of God. Don't you love that? He's Lord and God, the Son of God. That's so Trinitarian. He is God. He's the Son of God. I'll start it over. And that Christ being Lord and God, the Son of God, and appearing formerly in power as man and angel, and in the glory of the fire as at the bush, so also is manifested at the judgment executed on Sodom, has been demonstrated fully by what he what has been said. Okay, that's really cool. So what's he saying? He's saying, yeah, you see Jesus now as a man, as a carpenter's son, as a preacher in Galilee, but you've actually seen him before in the form of a man. Like when Joshua bowed down to him, uh, the captain of Yahweh's armies, Uh, you saw him in the form of an angel, the angel of the Lord. I have a whole video on that if you want to check it out. You saw him in the glory of the fire of the burning bush. That was Jesus speaking to Moses, according to Justin Martyr. And you saw him execute the judgment on Sodom. He's going back to Genesis 19, 24, where Yahweh calls down fire and brimstone from Yahweh out of heaven, the son calling it down from the father both being involved in executing judgment on Sodom. I have a whole video on that too. If you go find in the Three Crowns playlist, Genesis 18 and 19. So Justin Martyr is applying works of Yahweh in the Old Testament to Jesus and just straightforwardly saying, yeah, that was him. He does this all the time. Uh, This one's cool. Permit me to recount the prophecies, which I wish to do in order to prove that Christ is called both God and Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts. So. Justin Martyr is saying, I can prove that Jesus is Yahweh of hosts from the Old Testament. I can prove that he's the Lord of hosts. And what's really interesting, if you follow the footnote, which I did earlier today, and you go to his dialogue with Trifo, um, in fact, I'll pull that up. 
Why not? I had it pulled up. I'll pull it up so you can see this. It's really cool where he goes to prove this. Um, he goes to Psalm 24, which I think is pretty interesting. So let me pull this up for you. If you follow that footnote, you get to Dialogue with Trifo, chapter uh, 128. So here's what the website had just quoted. And that Christ being Lord and God, the Son of God, and appearing formally in power as man and angel, and in the glory of the fire at the bush, so also was manifested at the judgment executed on Sodom, has been fully demonstrated by what has been said. You know what? That's the other quote. Let me... I wanted to take you to the footnote number 11. Let me see which chapter that's in. That's in chapter 36. Okay, bear with me real quick. I got to get to chapter 36. And it won't take long at all. So chapter 36. Yeah, he proves that Christ is called Lord of hosts. So this is this is what I wanted y'all to see. It's pretty cool. He takes us to Psalm 24. So... As you wish, this is Justin speaking to Trifo. As you wish, Trifo, I shall come to these proofs which you seek in the fitting place. But now you will permit me first to recount the prophecies which I wish to do in order to prove that Christ is called both God and Lord of hosts. And in context, that's Yahweh of hosts. Uh, And Jacob in parable by the Holy Spirit and your interpreters, as God says, are foolish since they say that reference is made to Solomon and not to Christ when he bore the ark of the testimony in the temple, which he built the Psalm of David is this it's Psalm 24 in your Bibles. So he's going to say, people who think this is about Solomon are foolish. This is about Jesus. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and all that dwell therein. He has founded it upon the seas and prepared it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand at his holy place? He that is clean of hands and pure of heart, who has not received his soul in vain and has not sworn guilefully to his neighbor. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and mercy from God his Savior. This is the generation of them that seek the Lord, that seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your gates, you rulers, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty in battle. Lift up your gates, you rulers, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now, go to your Bibles, open up Psalm 24. That is Yahweh of hosts. Lord of hosts. Yahweh of hosts. It is the God of Israel. He is the King of glory. And now, how does Justin interpret this? Accordingly, it is shown that Solomon is not the Lord of hosts. Yeah, no duh. Solomon's not Yahweh. That guy went crazy at the end of his life. But when our Christ rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, the rulers in heaven under appointment of God are commanded to open the gates of heaven that he who is the king of glory may enter in and having ascended may sit on the right hand of the father until he make the enemies his footstool as has been made manifest by another psalm. For when the rulers of heaven saw him of uncomely and dishonored appearance and inglorious, not recognizing him, they inquired, who is the king of glory? And the Holy Spirit, either from the person of his father or from his own person, look at that. He believes the Holy Spirit's a person. Look at that. A distinct person from the father. This is before Nicaea. You got the whole Trinity here in Justin's writings. He answers them. The spirit answers them. The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. For everyone will confess that none of those who presided over the gates of the temple at Jerusalem would venture to say concerning Solomon that he was so glorious a king or concerning the ark of the testimony who is the king of glory. So it's Jesus being called Yahweh of hosts in in Justin's letter here. And he's using Psalm 24 as a proof of the full divinity of Jesus Christ. And again, that's really cool how he has the personhood of the Holy Spirit in there as well. So that's awesome. He believes in Jesus' preexistence. He believes that he had appeared as a man, as an angel, as the as uh, the fiery bush. He believes that he is Yahweh of hosts. And uh, let's see, let's see what else Justin Martyr has to say about the pre-existence of Christ. We'll go back to that stand to reason. Um, and let's get back up to Justin here. All right. So Justin also says this. Therefore, these words testify explicitly that he, Jesus, is witness to him 
by the Father who established these things as deserving to be worshipped as God and as Christ. So, see the... Oh, I didn't have that added to the stage. There you go. See, the Unitarian, they understand worshipping him as, as Christ. But Justin is saying we worship him both as God and as Christ, as divine and as human. We worship him as the God who is also man, anointed by God. We worship him as God and God's anointed. So uh, Justin Martyr is is clearly showing us the preexistence of Christ. But I think my favorite one to show the preexistence of Christ is Melito of Sardis. If you haven't um, ever read this passage from Melito of Sardis, it is just so glorious and, and moving. So glorious and moving. Yo, what's up? Good to see you here, Desmond. God bless you, brother. What up, what up? All right, listen to this. This is Melito of Sardis. He died around 180, so this had to have been written before 180. And it says this. He that hung up the earth in space was himself hanged up. So the one who stretched out the heavens, the one who created the universe, he himself was hung on a tree. He that fixed the heavens was fixed with nails. He that bore up the earth was borne up on a tree. The Lord of all was subjected to ignominy in a naked body. God put to, to death. So it's really clear that Melito of Sardis considers Jesus to be the creator of the universe. He's saying Jesus co-created the universe with the Father and the Spirit, and this one who made all of space and time was actually entering into it, and when he entered into it, he was hung upon a tree, and his hands were nailed. In order that he might not be seen, the luminaries turned away, and the day became darkened because they slew God, who hung naked on the tree. And Jordan, this is not using God in just any, you know, lesser sense. This is talking about God, the creator, God who hung the earth in space, God who hung the heavens up and, and put the stars up. So I think that um, it's impossible for you to say God is being used here in a lesser sense because there's only one creator and Melito sees that creator as being nailed to the cross. This is he who made the heaven and the earth and in the beginning together with the father, distinct from the father, two different persons, together they created the universe, fashioned man who was announced by means of the law and the prophets, who put on a bodily form in the virgin, who was hanged upon the tree, who was buried in the earth, who rose from the place of the dead and ascended to the height of heaven and sat at the right hand of the father. You cannot deny that Melito of Sardis believed in the full divinity of Jesus Christ. There is no way to interpret that as him talking about some lesser deity, some lesser Elohim, some, you know, almost godlike figure. No, he's talking about Jesus as the creator of the universe and then being put to death by humans he had created. That's what's going on here. Um, Jordan, I do see you talking in the comments here, and I'm glad you're asking questions. Um, so. Your question, what about in chapter 56, when uh, you're talking about Justin, I think, where he says Jesus is different, uh, a different God than the Father and maker of all things. So the distinction in the early church is, is the same distinction in the Bible. God the Father is the maker of all things, and he does it through Jesus Christ. It's John 1. It's Colossians 1. So there is a distinction in the work of the persons. The Father says this is the plan, and, and Christ is the agent through which he accomplishes the plan. But that means both are eternal because both are there before creation and both are in a category of their own outside of creation, not being counted among created things. It's very often that the early church will say, you know, uh, the one God maker of all things and the Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things were made. That's 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But that right there shows the co-equality in the act of creation. Uh, Everything in the Trinity is sort of done. This is a basic formula. It's not always the case, but it's it's generally the case. Uh, by the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Think about uh, think about you know the way the Bible's written. It's it's the testimony of of the Father through the Word, inspired by the Spirit, right? By God through the Son in the Holy Spirit. We pray to the Father through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? This is Everything is deeply Trinitarian. So yeah, there's a distinction between the Father and the Son. 
in and uh, their role in creation, but they're both there doing the work of creation. So uh, you said, I don't think you really got what Dale was arguing, Dane, with respect. I think I got what he was arguing just fine, Jordan, also with respect to you. Uh, he was arguing that the early church didn't teach that Jesus is fully divine, that he they didn't teach he's the God man, and that they didn't teach the Trinity. I've shown example. He said that. You can go back and watch the discussion I had with him. I've shown that they were using the word Trinity well before Nicaea. The earliest uh, use of Trinity is uh, Theo, uh, Theophilus of Antioch in the year 180. Tertullian's using it in the 200s. Origen's using it in the 200s. Methodius is using it in the uh, late 200s, early 300s. It's there well before Nicaea. In fact, there's a video on the YouTube channel called uh, Trinity Apologetics, and it's called 15 Christians Who Used the Word Trinity Before 325 AD. I'll tell you the truth. Um, it, the the Unitarian apologists, they just play fast and loose with, with the details, um, and they they aren't being fully honest, or, or maybe they're just not even fully aware of it, that the early church clearly taught the deity of Christ. Like, I've got this quote right here up on screen. Jordan, I'd love to hear what you think. Like, please comment, bro. They hung up on the cross the one who hung up earth in, in space itself. Pre, so you're saying uh, pre-existing creation of the world doesn't mean one is eternal. The Arians held that view also. Yeah, but that's not what Dale Tuggy's view is. Uh, Dale Tuggy's view is that Jesus originates in the womb. Um, but also pre-existing all of creation um, does mean that you're not created yourself. Like all creation has to mean something. So, and 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 there are other, we'll get to it. I haven't gotten there yet. There are other early church uh, quotations where they talk about Jesus being eternal and uh, outside of time. And these kind of things. So, in fact, I might I might see if I can find that real quick. Well, I don't want to. Maybe I should stick to my. Maybe I should. Okay, we'll go to it real quick since um since we're talking about it. So, this is uh this is Ignatius, and this is from his letter to Polycarp. It, Polycarp was a student of John. Ignatius, a student of Polycarp. Ignatius himself may have studied under the Apostle John. This is early, early, early early church, y'all. Uh, Ignatius is writing, uh, look at his lifetime here, 50 to 117. It's very possible that he learned from John himself. And now, Jordan, look at this. Look at this. This goes even beyond, obviously, uh, obviously, Dale Tuggy, this goes beyond his view of Jesus because he believes Jesus originated in Mary's womb. This goes, of course, beyond the Arians as well. Uh, look at what Ignatius says. Wait expectantly for the one who is above time, the eternal, the invisible, who for our sake became visible, the intangible, the unsuffering, who for our sake suffered, who for our sake endured in every way. So he's talking about Jesus, obviously. He's not talking about the Father here because the Father didn't suffer on the cross. Jesus is the one who suffered. But he says Jesus was once unsuffering. He's above all time. He's eternal. But he became visible and took on a human body and could suffer in that. And he did that. So, Jordan, yeah, that's even further than the Arians. I don't know if you were here earlier also when I quoted Origen, but Origen very clearly says only illogical people will say there was a time when the sun was not. So the early church clearly saw Jesus as eternal. And I hope you were here for the earlier part of this video, too. If not, go back and watch it, Jordan. But um. Tertullian, Origen, uh, Methodius, Hippolytus, all these guys saying Jesus shares the same substance as the Father. He shares the same essence of the Father, and therefore he's eternal because the Father's essence doesn't change. doesn't come into existence. Let me show you all another really cool one uh, from uh, – this is – I told you I'd have a new quote from Theophilus of Antioch. I've, I've used his quote where he says Trinity – uh, before. And this is a different quote from Theophilus that I've never used live on air before, if I can find it real quick. Here it comes. One second. This is really cool. I like this one. So 
Theophilus, this is like before the year 180. He writes this. I want to get, let me just get to the part I want to get to. All right, here we go. For the divine writing itself teaches us that Adam said that he heard the voice. So this is talking about Genesis 3, 8. But what else is this voice but the word of God, who is also his son? Not as the poets and writers of myths talk of sons of gods begotten from intercourse with women, but as truth expounds the word that always exists. Again, Jordan, they are teaching he's eternal. That always exists. That's a way of speaking about being eternal. He always exists, the word of God, the son of God, who was talking to Adam in the garden. Unitarians, you're going to have to deal with the early church, y'all. You're going to have to deal with the early church. That always exists residing in the heart of God. So Theophilus of Antioch quite clearly believed in the preexistence of Christ and ascribes to Christ works of God in the Old Testament, specifically that of walking around the garden with Adam and with Eve. All right, let's keep going. Um, I've got more quotes on the full divinity of Jesus. So, so we've shown that the word Trinity is used. We've shown that the early church believed Jesus shares the same substance and essence as the Father. We've shown that they believe Jesus pre-exists the New Testament, that he's doing all these works of Yahweh in the Old Testament. We've seen Justin Martyr specifically identify him as Yahweh of hosts. Now let's look at some others where it's just um, proof of the deity of Christ, where it's just proof that they saw him as fully God. And we'll go look at some more right now. All right, let's look at some more from, well, let's, let's go to uh, Irenaeus of Lyons, the French bishop. So Irenaeus of Lyons, 130 to 202, he's a, a bishop of the church in uh, what is modern-day France. And he, like Ignatius, studied under Polycarp. So this is, again, in that spiritual lineage of the Apostle John. And let's see what he says. There's lots of them. Um, how about this? He received testimony from all that he was very man and that he was very God, from the Father, from the Spirit, from angels, from the creation itself, from men, from apostate spirits and demons. So he's saying that everybody has seen uh, and testified that Jesus is very God. The Father testifies that Jesus is very God. The Spirit testifies that he is very God. The angels testify that he is very God. Even the creation itself, the stars proclaim the glory of the very God, Jesus Christ. There are men who proclaim he's very God, like Bishop uh, Irenaeus right here, for example, like myself, for example, I proclaim that he's very God. Even apostates proclaimed he was very God. They may have denied that confession of faith later in life, but they at once did it. And of course, the demons know that he's very God and they shudder, right? So again, Jordan had this concern at the very beginning that we can't just run with an early church father calling Jesus God, because that term is used more loosely in the ancient world than it is now. So they had a way of letting you know, I'm not using it loosely in this context. I'm using it very particularly to talk about the most high supreme God. And the way they would do that is by saying, very God, like the qualifier there of very God. Bishop of Lyons, he is very God. Jesus Christ is very God. And all the creation testifies to this. The Father testifies to this. See, it doesn't diminish the Father's glory that Jesus Christ is also fully God. He testifies to it. Jesus is very God, not just a God, not just God-like. He is very God, meaning most high God and supreme God. And here we go. This is the big one. This one is absolutely huge. Jordan, if you're still here, pay attention to this one, bro. This is going to change your mind right now. You're going to become a Trinitarian. Watch out. I'm not a prophet, so I don't know if that's actually true or not, but watch out. You, you may need to turn it off. If you, if you want to stay Unitarian, you may need to turn this one off right here. This is going to convince you. There's no way to be honest with this and not convince you that at least Irenaeus in the early church believed that Jesus is, is fully God. Look at this. Look at this, y'all. 
Christ himself, therefore, together with the Father, is the God of the living, who spoke to Moses, and who was also manifested to the fathers. So, Jesus Christ, with the Father, is the Most High God, the God of the living. How do I know that God of the living is a title of the Most High God? Well, because of Jesus. Because of what Jesus told us. Do y'all remember? It's so fitting that we're talking about this on Holy Tuesday. This is something Jesus said on Holy Tuesday. Look at how it all comes together full, full circle. Let me pull up Matthew 22 for you. This is some of the conversations Jesus was having on that blessed Holy Tuesday so many years ago. And the Sadducees come up to him and ask him about the resurrection. Y'all remember this? Remember how the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection? They were the skeptical liberals of their era, and they were um, obviously way off base and had a lot of egg on their face when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And clearly the resurrection of the dead is is a true and, and holy doctrine. So they come up to Jesus and they want to basically tell him, eh, this resurrection doctrine is nonsense. Let's, let's, uh, let's see what, if we can trip Jesus up. So they say this to him. That day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him. Teacher, they said, Moses declared that if a man dies without having children, his brother is to marry the widow and raise up the offspring for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died without having children. So he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brothers down to the seventh. And last of all, the woman died in the resurrection. Then whose wife will she be? For all of them were married to her. Here's Jesus' answer. You are mistaken because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. In the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Instead, they will be like the angels in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Who is the God of the living? It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? El Shaddai, Almighty God, the one true God, the God of Israel. So Jesus Christ himself says the God of the living is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is Yahweh God, the true God, the one God. Check this out. Let's go back to what Irenaeus of Lyons wrote. Let's go back to it. Keep that in mind. Jesus just told us who the God of the living is. That title is applied to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob by our Lord himself on Holy Tuesday confronting the Sadducees. And what does Irenaeus say? He says, Christ himself, therefore, together with the Father, two persons are one God of the living, who spoke to Moses, who was also manifested to the fathers. Who spoke to Moses? Well, it was Christ and the Father. Who was manifested to the fathers? Well, it was Christ and the Father. Because Christ and the Father are the God of the living. This is written in Irenaeus's Against Heresies. This is orthodoxy. It is orthodox to believe that Christ is the God of the living. That means he's the most high God. That means he's Yahweh. He's Yahweh who spoke to Moses. He's Yahweh who was manifested to the fathers. Jesus is fully divine. Irenaeus proclaimed it far before Nicaea. A student of Polycarp, a student of John. Y'all, be honest with this stuff. This is what the early church taught. Let's go back to Irenaeus, see what else he has to say. Um, let's see this. Carefully, then, has the Holy Ghost pointed out by what has been said, his birth from a virgin, and his essence, that he is God. So, yes, he takes on human form, but his essence is that of God. His nature is that of God. See, again, Unitarians will say this ridiculous thing. It is ridiculous, Unitarians, when, if you're watching, that nobody was talking about Jesus being of the same essence as the Father or the same substance as the Father. All these quotes I've been giving to you from Tertullian to Methodius to Hippolytus to Origen, now to Irenaeus, they're saying he is the same essence as the Father, the same substance as the Father. All of this well predates Nicaea. And he shows that he is a man. Good, we agree on that. We should not understand that he is mere man only. It was kind of funny when I when I told Dale Tuggy that um, uh, Jesus, uh, why he believed Jesus was just a mere man. He was like, well, I don't think he's a mere man. He's a very special man. 
But Irenaeus is also pointing out to the heretics, we can't call him a mere man. He And he's not just a special man. He's much more than that. He is God with us. He is the essence of God. We should not understand him as a mere man only. We should not expect him to be a mere man. That is Irenaeus' way of saying we should not expect him to be merely a creature. Jordan, you'll have to be more specific. Did Dale claim what? I don't know what what which claim. That uh that none of the early church taught the Trinity before Nicaea? I'm pretty sure that's what he said. I wanted to play the clip for you all at the beginning, but the the audio wasn't working for some reason. Maybe I could try again, but I don't know what that's about. Um, you said I don't claim that Justin thought that, Tertullian thought that. Are you talking about the Trinity, that j- you agree Justin and Tertullian believed in the Trinity? So I'm not. Yeah, and Knights of God, I agree with you. Um, I was just sticking with the text of the quote that uh, Irenaeus clearly believes Jesus and the Father were manifested um, to Moses. But yeah, I think the Holy Spirit too. Um, let's see. Jordan, uh, so did Dale claim that he said no one said they shared in nature? Um, I'll have to go back and, and listen to it. What he what he claimed was nobody taught the uh, deity of Christ or the Trinity before Nicaea. That was basically what he was saying. And I don't want to put words in his mouth. I put the timestamp in there. It's... Uh, one hour, 30 minutes, and 38 seconds, you start it. Um, and numeric is right. Dale Tuggy did explicitly say that Jesus was just a man. That's his, whole, that's his whole philosophy and theology. His whole thing is that Jesus is just a man. Same with Carlos Xavier when I debated him. Uh, he, he even thinks the Arians, who have a low view of Jesus, he thinks even they have too high a view of Jesus. He's taking it a step down from the heretics view. And... Um, saying that Jesus is just a man, nothing more, nothing less. And um, so, all right, Jordan wants an exact quote. I'll see if I can, let me see if I can get this to work. Last time I tried, the audio didn't work. I'll try again. I wanted you all to hear it too. I'm not trying to hide anything. Uh, I'm, I try to be very transparent. Y'all let me know if, uh, let me know if this audio works. Cross your fingers. Uh, let's see. I got to get it back to where, where we want to start it. Why can't y'all hear it? I'm so confused. Um, doesn't make sense. I, I play videos all the time. I just don't get it. Y'all go to the video. You got to watch it yourself. Jordan, I'm not trying to hide anything from you, bro. I promise. I've tried twice to play the vid- video. Um, what did W. Scott Taylor say? Glad to see you here, brother. Uh. My citations of acknowledgments of the Trinity before Nicaea is my new source. Um, glad glad it's helpful. Uh, yeah, add it to your library of citations. Um, if you all if you all want, I could listen to it. And or hey, numeric, did you go and if you want to? It sounded like you went and listened to what Doctor Tuggy said in our conversation. If you wouldn't mind transcribing it and putting it in the comments, that'd be cool. Uh, no pressure. You don't have to, but I just, it looked like you had um, gone back and listened to it. But uh, look, regardless of what Dr. Tuggy said, it's very clear that the early church had an understanding of the Trinity before Nicaea and that the deity of Christ was fully believed before Nicaea, that they were talking about Jesus sharing the substance of the father before Nicaea, sharing his essence before Nicaea, I've given lots and lots of of 
proof of that today. And it really is indisputable. So Jordan, for you to maintain your position, for Dr. Tuggy to maintain his position, you would have to just believe that the church went way off the rails on her doctrine of God within the, the first century of the church. You would have to believe that um, they, they fundamentally misunderstood the person and the, and the nature of Christ from the get-go. And I'm sorry, I, my view of the Holy Spirit is far too high to believe that he would allow that kind of rampant mess up in the universally, you know, throughout the church. So I just don't, I just don't buy it, but I've, I've clearly proven that the early church saw Jesus as God, most high God, creator of the universe, one with the father, eternal, timeless, all of that. That's what they were teaching. Um, so let's go back. I got a few more. I want to show you. So, Clement of Alexandria, let's see what he says. Um, I'll read both of his. This word then, the Christ, the cause of both our being at first, for he was in God, and of our well-being, this very word has now appeared as a man, he alone being both God and man, the author of all blessings to us, by whom we, being taught to live well, are sent on our way to life eternal. The word who in the beginning bestowed on us life as creator when he formed us. So look, again, the word is the creator who formed us, taught us to live well when he appeared as our teacher, that as God, he might afterwards conduct us to life, which never ends. And again, I would argue that that is God being used in the most high sense. Only the eternal God can propel us into eternal life. I know that Moses gets called an Elohim. I know Samuel gets called an Elohim. I know that uh, even fallen angels can get called Elohim, but none of them would be powerful enough to give eternal life. Jesus is powerful enough to give eternal life. That's a prerogative of full divinity. Clement, and by the way, Clement is year 150 to, to uh, 215. Clement also writes, For it is not without divine care that so great a work was accomplished in so brief a space by the Lord, who, though despised as to appearance, was in reality adored, the expiator of sin, the Savior, the Clement, the divine word, he, he that is truly most manifest deity. He that is truly most manifest deity. He that is made equal to the Lord of the universe, because he was his son and the word was in God. So he is saying Jesus is equal to the Father, equal to the Lord of the universe. That's the Father. He is equal to the Father. And he is called the most, the truly most manifest deity. Absolutely stunning, beautiful. And I love it. I just love it. So we could, uh, we could go on this, this, I put this link in there and uh, it's, it's a great link. You can read more quotes. Origin again, Jesus Christ in the last times divesting himself of his glory became a man and was incarnate, although God, and while made a man remained God, which he was. So it's saying he's God, empties himself, takes on human flesh, but remains God even while in the human flesh. This is the doctrine of the incarnation, which the church has been, been careful to protect and proclaim. So, uh, Let's see. We could we could go on. Let's let's go back to Ignatius. There's another good one from Ignatius. Um, right here, there is only one physician who is both flesh and spirit, born and unborn, God and man, true life and death, both from Mary and from God, first subject to suffering and then beyond it. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Jesus Christ is the one physician, uh, who is flesh and spirit. That's a way of saying man and God born and unborn, meaning born by Mary, but also eternal, you know, having, having a beginning, but also not having a beginning that's man and God. Then he just says it plain God and man, both man and God, true life, like eternal life. He is the life, the way, the truth, the life, but also he dies, you know, uh, and can it be, um, that thou, my God, shouldst die for me, you know, tis mystery all the immortal dies. 
as Charles Wesley would say. And so then from Mary and from God, again, a human and a divine nature, first subject to suffering and then beyond it. So passable and impassable, right? Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Ignatius is very clearly proclaiming the deity of Christ. Look, we could go on and on and on and on and on all day. On and on and on all day. Hey, <laughs> CC, you say this guy's confusing, having a beginning but not having a beginning. And, and then you're laughing about that. Listen, the doctrine of the incarnation, it's not confusing. It's, it's just really deep. Um, it's the idea that the creator of the universe entered into the creation. It's the idea that the eternal God took on human flesh. And so it's the idea that there is this one divine person, Jesus Christ, who has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. The divine nature has no beginning. The human nature does. The divine nature uh, doesn't suffer. The human nature does. The divine nature is, uh, is begotten of God the Father. The human nature begotten of Mary, right? So I, I don't want you to think it's confusing. I want you to think of it as uh, just beautiful and, and profound. Um, beautiful and profound. CC, I agree. The father didn't take on human flesh. That's a heresy. That's, um, that's the oneness modalist heresy. So Chinianism, uh, it's a heresy. Yeah. <laughs> you said, oh no, it is confusing. All right. Well, I tried. <laughs> I don't actually think it's that confusing. It's, it's the idea of, of, uh, the unification of two things in one. So, the way that a husband and a wife become one flesh. Well, there's still the distinct feminine and there's still the distinct masculine. They come together and they're one flesh or there's, there's evening and there's morning, but there's one day. These, these things that almost seem opposite, they come together and they create one harmonious unity in Jesus. There is full divinity and full humanity and they come together as one. Um, CC says, the Father is the only true God. You don't believe Jesus. I do believe Jesus. He says uh, that you have to believe in the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom God has sent. Jesus Christ is also called true God, 1 John 5.20. Jesus is called true light. Uh, that doesn't mean the Father isn't also true light. Jesus is called the only Lord and Master, Jude 1.4. But that doesn't mean the Father is not also Lord. So you have to be careful just taking verses um, in a vacuum. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word uh, the word was with God, and the word was God. Right. Um, so, yeah, you should you should believe God's Messiah. God's Messiah is our Lord and our God. John twenty twenty eight. He is the Word who is eternal with God. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't have time to to derail this with with what you're saying. I'm not making no. I'm not making contradictions. Actually, CC. Uh, I don't know how long you've been here, but I'm, I've been showing you that the early church has always believed uh, three persons, one God. There's no contradiction there. A contradiction would be one person and three persons. No Trinitarian makes that claim. Another contradiction would be one God, three gods. No Trinitarian makes that claim. But one God and three persons is not a contradiction. Same way you can say uh, one flesh two people, husband and wife, not a contradiction. So you should, you should go and study the laws of uh, logic and specifically the law of non-contradiction. And you'll realize the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't have a contradiction in it. Um, Elaine here, she says that um, Tuggy has a straight historical error. There weren't any Trinitarians in the 100s and 200s and in the first half of the 300s. Thank you for going and listening to it. Jordan, I hope you'll go listen to it as well. But he does say that it's, um, it's just, He's wrong, like, and he should know better because he's a PhD. And I worry that he's playing fast and loose with the data, but I'm always going to be charitable and just say that he's just had a hard time with interpreting the data. Um, and maybe he's, he's reading it too quickly or something. I don't know. I can't speak for him, but I've proven here today, like there is no doubt that Tertullian was using the word Trinity, that Methodius was using the word Trinity origin uh theophilus of antioch it's clear that ignatius and irenaeus were trying to get the point across of the full divinity of christ so was clement so was melito of sardis all of that um so dr tuggy is just factually wrong about that 
uh, the last fry says, is paradox a fair word to describe the Trinity? So I, I don't want to say a paradox either. I think it's, I do think it's mysterious. Um, we can still talk about it. Like it's not, it's not so mysterious that there's nothing to be said about it. I, I grant that there's clearly mystery to it, but obviously we want the God of the universe to transcend our own mind. Uh, any, any God that you could totally figure out perfectly wouldn't be the real God because the real God transcends the mind of a human. And we get this from the Bible. Isaiah, is it, is it chapter 55 where he says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. The ontological reality of an eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God should be bigger than anything we could put into a box in our own mind. So I wouldn't call it a paradox. It's certainly not a contradiction, but yeah, there's mystery there. I got no problem with the word mystery. Hey, let me all, let me show you all something else that Melito of Sardis wrote. I just think it's beautiful. And so, and he doesn't get enough airtime, you know? Ignatius gets a lot of airtime. Augustine, of course, gets a ton of airtime. But uh, Melito of Sardis doesn't get enough airtime. And this is from his work on Pascha. And since this is the only time during Holy Week I'll see you all, I thought it'd be fitting to show you something from his work on Pascha. It's actually where we get that other quote from that I read from Melito. But this is just kind of cool. All right. We'll start here at seven. For the law was a word, and the old was new, going out from Zion and Jerusalem, and the commandment was grace, and the type was a reality, and the lamb was a son, and the sheep was a man, and the man was God. For he was born a son, and led as a lamb, and slaughtered as a sheep, and buried as a man, and rose from the dead as God, being God by his nature and a man. He is all things. He is law in that he judges. He is word in that he teaches. He is grace in that he saves. He is father in that he begets. And by the way, he doesn't mean he is God the father. He means he's the father of the church. He is son in that he is begotten. He is sheep in that he suffers. He is human in that he is buried. He is God in that he is raised up. This is Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I just wanted to share that with you because I think it's beautiful. Um, so, all right, that's probably enough for us to chew on today. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Let me recap a little bit. You have direct references to the Trinity in Tertullian, Methodius, Hippolytus, Origen, or not, well, it's, uh, Hippolytus isn't a direct reference. It's a direct reference to the sharing of the substance. We have a direct reference to the Trinity in those authors. And again, let me actually pull this up so you can see it. Go find this video. This is a helpful video. Go find this video by uh, Trinity Apologetics. Go find the video on Trinity Apologetics. 15 early Christians who used the word Trinity before 325 AD, which is the year of Nicaea, 15. So it's used 15 times before Nicaea, at least by 15 different authors. I mean, not just 15 times by 15 different authors. So we have clear references to the Trinity in the early church. Then we have clear references to the son of God, Jesus Christ, uh, being believed in the early church to be Yahweh and doing the works of Yahweh in the old Testament. We saw that in Justin Martyr. We saw that in Melito of Sardis. Justin Martyr said that Jesus is the one talking to Moses in the burning bush, that he was the angel of the Lord, that he's the one that executed judgment on Sodom. And Melito of Sardis was saying Jesus is the creator of the world. And then we have just clear direct references to the full divinity of Jesus Christ from Irenaeus and Ignatius. Ignatius saying that he is the impassable one who becomes passable. Uh, Irenaeus talking about him as very God. Irenaeus saying he is the God of the living, which is always in scripture, a reference to Yahweh, the most high God. So we had Clement of Alexandria talking about the, the full deity manifest in the word. It's just there. It's just all there. The early church fathers, clearly Trinitarians, clearly believing in the full deity of Christ, 
this is not even controversial. In fact, what's actually really interesting is when you look at the issues in the early church and where they spent their time, what doctrines they most ardently protected and clarified. It's always about the Trinity. This was the first and greatest doctrine that they wanted to protect and clarify. They didn't start with the atonement. They didn't start with, uh, you know, whether, whether we should have an Episcopal or a Congregationalist church government. They didn't start with those kinds of things. They started with protecting the divinity of Christ, fighting off the Arians, fighting off the Socinians, fighting off all of these Christolo Christological heresies and Trinitarian heresies, or I guess more Unitarian heresies. Uh, I should have phrased that differently. So the church, she has seen the doctrine of the Trinity as the most precious jewel, the centerpiece on the royal diadem of, of doctrines. And I am going to stand with the church. I'm going to stand with Tertullian on the Trinity. I'm going to stand with Methodius on the Trinity. I'm going to stand with Hippolytus on it. I'm going to stand with Justin Martyr on it. I'm going to stand with Melito of Sardis on it. I'm going to stand with Ignatius of Antioch on it. I'm going to stand with Polycarp on it. I'm going to stand with Irenaeus of Lyons on it. I'm going to stand with these great fathers of the church. And they were willing to give their blood and their life for these things. I'm willing to give my time and energy for it. Hopefully I don't ever you know, live in a country where they would kill me for saying that. But listen, this is this is the fight. This is the big one. The the glory of Christ is at stake. The glory of the Holy Spirit is at stake. The glory of the triune God is at stake. The glory of the Father is at stake because we glorify him as we see the Son and worship the Son. To all my Unitarian friends out there, all my other shows have been, you know, pretty much purely biblical based. Today, I wanted to jump into the early church fathers. Go check out my other shows, but please at least admit to yourself, no matter what you think about the Bible, and, and we'll continue to go back and forth on that, what the Bible's teaching, but at least admit to yourself, Tertullian clearly taught the Trinity. Like he uses the word Trinity and says they are one unity and Trinity, but three persons. Like, Please just be honest enough to admit that. Please be honest enough to admit that Melito of Sardis obviously saw Jesus as the creator of the universe. Please be honest enough that Methodius believed that the, the one dominion was shared by three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that the kingdom of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was, was one kingdom with one king, but their Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be willing to just admit that Ignatius believed God became flesh. Yeah. Jordan, respectfully, uh, I've, I've read Tertullian, bro. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I hate credential bragging, but I, I did go to divinity school at Vanderbilt, got my master's. Um, so I'm, I'm well, I'm well aware of what the early church fathers, you know, wrote. Um, have I read all of his works? I, I don't know if I've read every letter uh, uh, that he ever wrote, but I've read a lot of Tertullian. I've read a lot of Augustine. I've read a lot of um, Irenaeus. Um, I've read, I try to, I try to stay up on my early church. And the, the thing is, is um, they, they do teach the deity of Christ. <laughs> like they just do. Uh, CC, are they infallible? I said at the very beginning of the video, they're not infallible. Only the Bible is infallible and and Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics can make a case for holy tradition being infallible and I'm I'm all ears. Uh but no, the early church fathers in and of themselves aren't infallible. But when they speak about something universally, that's weighty. That's super weighty. When because remember CC, the church is the pillar of truth according to St. Paul in um his letters to Timothy. Remember that Jesus says he's building his church upon the rock and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Remember the church is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. 
the church, when the church makes universal claims, that's weighty. Even if you don't think it's infallible, it's super duper weighty. Hey, W. Scott Taylor, thank you so much, brother, for your generous gift of $20. We, we really appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you for supporting our ministry. It just means so much. Thank you. Um, right, Benjamin, I wasn't trying to imply the Orthodox teach the fathers are infallible. The Orthodox would teach that holy tradition is infallible, but that individual fathers could err. I wasn't trying to imply that. Um, let's see. Jordan, I am certain you haven't, which is okay. One needs to do that if they are going to claim they taught things, though. Tertullian said things about this topic you definitely won't agree with. That is my point. I never claimed that I agree with everything Tertullian wrote. I was saying that I proved today that he wrote about the Trinity as three persons and one unity. So uh, I don't know. I don't know why you're. Um, are you denying that? Like, did you did you agree that that I, I read Tertullian? And he said, one in unity, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that they share the substance. So, I, I uh, you know, I, I just read it, you know, what it said. I've never claimed that I'll agree with every single church father on every single point. Like, I don't agree with everything Origen said. Origen was a universalist. And I don't agree with that. What I'm saying, though, is when every single person in the early church believed in the deity of Christ, and that's also what the Bible teaches, that's weighty. That's super duper weighty. So, um, all right. Well, it's probably time to wrap up. Uh, although I know y'all are going at it in the comments and, and having fun there. Um, the last fry... I don't know. Some of these questions, I don't know if they're talking to me or uh or someone else in the comments. So, I don't know. All right y'all, I love you. God bless you. Um keep the faith. Be strong and courageous in the world. Go out in grace and peace. Hopefully this has been helpful. Go back and look at all these quotes that I I brought to the table today. Go study them in your own time. Receive now this benediction. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, three we name thee. Though in essence only one, undivided God we claim thee, and adoring we bend the knee while we own the mystery. This has been Three Crowns brought to you by Faith Unaltered. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And till next time we meet, um, be living like Christ. Have a wonderful Easter. Those of you who are on the Western calendar, for all my Eastern calendar folks, you can have a wonderful Easter like next month or something. But to everybody else, have a wonderful Holy Week. God bless you. Till next time. Peace out. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.